It is best to take precautions when meeting others, whether online or in person. You never know what kind of person you are dealing with until you get to know them. It could be a benign thing. You meet someone, hit off with them, become lovers or fast friends. Other times it can turn into a nightmare that threatens your life as well as the lives of people closest to you. For Dave Krupa, two women he met, one online and one in real life, were examples of both. One kind and loving, and the other turned into a nightmare. The problem was, he didn't know which was which until years later. Dave Krupa had never been married. His longtime girlfriend, Amy Flora, and Dave had two children together. But over time, the relationship became more and more strained. After 12 years together, Amy and Dave broke up. Dave decided to start a new life in Omaha, Nebraska, starting a new job as a mechanic. But he was lonely, as anyone would be. So he started dating, using apps like Plenty of Fish to find dates. Now he was upfront with the women he dated. He was not looking to be locked down in a relationship. He wanted to test the waters and look for companionship, sexual and casual. If they were okay with that, he was okay with them. If they weren't, he held no ill will towards them. In 2012, he met a woman named Shanna Goyler who went by the name Liz. She had children of her own. She seemed to enjoy his company, but like the rest, he told Liz that he wasn't interested in a relationship. At first, she seemed to understand this, but at the same time, she would push this to try to get him to be with her and only her. She would bug him through texts when he was on other dates, but she also tried to spice things up with a little bit of role play. While she was fun, there wasn't much of a spark between them. He just wasn't attracted to her like she hoped he would be, and by October of 2012, he had stopped seeing Liz. <laughs> Carrie Farver walked into Dave's life in November of 2012. She arrived at the shop he worked at because her SUV was having issues. According to Dave, he was immediately attracted to her. Carrie was a single mother, a computer programmer, born and raised in Macedonia, Iowa. She had her son Max at an early age. The relationship with Max's father had not gone to plan for her, but she had worked hard to make it work. She even put herself through college. Later on, as Dave was looking through one of the dating apps he was a part of, he came across Carrie's profile, so he swiped it, and he sent her a message saying, I know you, in a flirting way. She responded in kind. After texting back and forth, the two decided to go on a date to Applebee's. Carrie, during this date, was the one who told Dave that she wasn't looking for anything serious, which to him must have been like hitting the jackpot. So they headed back to his apartment. They weren't there long when the doorbell rang. Liz had been pestering Dave all night that she needed to get her stuff out of his apartment. He had told her that he was on a date, but she still blew up his phone. Well, she had come over to pick up her things. Carrie, sensing the tension, excused herself. Carrie passed Liz in the hall, and that was the extent of them meeting. Liz would pick up her things, and Dave would go back to his apartment, probably feeling a little bit cock-blocked. He ended up calling Carrie and she invited him over to her place, so he went. He drove an hour to her home in Macedonia, Iowa, and the two shared an intimate night. Dave seemed to like Carrie a lot. She was fun, she was beautiful, she was sexy, and everything he could possibly want in a woman. Carrie worked as a computer programmer, as I stated, and she worked 30 minutes from Dave's home. So, as the two were getting to know each other, Dave allowed her to stay at his place for a bit. This was because she was working on a huge project, and Dave, being a nice guy, thought it would be best for her to do it so close to where she worked. Long hours and a long drive are two things that no one wants to deal with. She happily obliged, contacting her mother to look over her son Max. On November 13, 2012, just two weeks after meeting Carrie, Dave went to work. He kissed her goodbye, excited for coming home to a woman that he was really into. You would think that would mean that he would want to just commit to Carrie, but no, he was just happy to have her around. The two had made it clear to one another that they were not ready to be in a committed relationship, which is why it came to a complete surprise when Dave got a text from Carrie. She asked him to move in together. Later that morning, I'm at work. And I get a text from Carrie that says, can we move in together? Now, that was 
extremely left field because after dating for two weeks, Carrie made it very clear to me that if we have a relationship, it's nothing serious. So I just texted back, that's not gonna happen. The boundaries had been set. They never talked like this before. And doing it over a text so abruptly caused him to pause. But when he responded that he was not interested in that, what happened next came to a bigger shock to him. Immediately I'm getting these texts. Fine, I hate you, go away, they've ruined my life, just on and on and on. Instead of answering back that it was just a joke or something lighthearted, Carrie's text back was harsh. Carrie broke it off claiming that she was seeing another person, that she hated him, and that Dave ruined her life. This left Dave confused, as it would anyone else. She was happily working on her large project when he had left that day, and yet these texts seemed to come from a completely different person altogether. But he had only dated her for two weeks. Hardly time to get to know everything about a person. So he wondered if he dodged a major bullet. Was her beauty hiding something more sinister? When he came home, her SUV wasn't around, and all her stuff was gone. She had left. But he would soon find out that this Carrie wouldn't leave him alone. Carrie suffered from depression. In fact, she had been diagnosed with bipolar disorder. She was on medication, but it seemed to Dave that she had gone off of it the day he last saw her. But it wasn't the last time that he would supposedly hear from her. What happened next is no less than strange. Even though Carrie had stated that she wanted to never hear from him again, she kept texting him. For multiple years, she texted him things ranging from I love you to I hate you. to showing affection then angrily harassing him. It wasn't just texts. It was emails as well. There were times that he was home and he would get messages from her telling him what he was doing and what he was wearing, showing that she was spying on him from the darkness. But it wasn't just him that she was messaging. Liz was also getting these messages, calling her a whore, claiming Liz ruined Carrie's life. Remember, these two only had a passing moment in the hallway. Liz came home one day to find that her garage had been broken into, and inside was a message spray-painted, whore, from Dave, as though Carrie wanted Dave to be blamed for the break-in. This stalking brought the two closer together, and the alleged Carrie was infuriated by this, leaving more and more harassing messages. But never voice messages, never calling, just emails, texts, and DMs. The messages were not limited to the two. No, Dave found that his work was getting harassing messages as well, as well as Liz's own business. You see, Liz was self-employed. Dave had to change phone numbers multiple times. The two tried to play it off by calling the person doing this Crazy Carrie, but Crazy Carrie wasn't going to leave well enough alone. One night, Liz was in her home with her children when she got a message from Carrie. Carrie was in her garage and asked Liz what Carrie should do to Liz's car, then took photos of the car to prove it. Liz went into the garage and there was no one there. A bit later, while sitting at home, Dave got a message with a photo of a bound and gagged woman in it. The bound and gagged woman was supposedly Liz. The message was from Carrie, and it read that if Dave wants her alive, that he should respond that he is breaking up with Liz and going back out with Carrie. He left it on red, and instead texted Liz to find out if she was fine. Turns out, Liz was just fine. On another night, Dave went to the home of Amy to see his children. He ended up getting an email. Carrie was inside his home. He rushed home to find a window smashed, but no one was there. In August of 2013, the worst came. It's Carrie. My last name's F-A-R-B-E-R. -E she kept texting me telling me she wanted to kill me and my kids. Liz's home was set on fire. Though no humans were home, her pets, including a cat, a dog, and a snake, perished in the fire. You would think with all of this that Dave and Liz would go to the police. They didn't have to, because the police were well aware of what was going on. Not because of them, but because of Carrie's mother, who had declared her daughter a missing person. Let's rewind back to that day in November of 2012. Carrie had just kissed Dave goodbye. She logged onto her Facebook to check her messages, and then after her first tirade against Dave, logged back in to unfriend him. So far, nothing suspicious. 
But then her job called her. She had not gone into work and she didn't answer her phone. She messaged her mother that she was quitting her job and moving to Kansas, which was strange. But Max mentioned that Carrie had gotten a job offer from a place in Kansas. But then he got messages and both began noticing something was off about them. There were spelling errors littered throughout the messages, which was unlike Carrie. But Carrie said that she would return for her brother's wedding. That was when she said she would pick up her son and move to a new life, which the wedding happened and Carrie didn't show up. And it was unlike Carrie to leave her son because she loved her son. So her mother, fearing that her daughter was having a nervous breakdown, called the police and filed a missing persons report. But the message they were both receiving through this entire issue made them wonder if Carrie was really behind it. When they would get a text, they would call and there would be no answer. Carrie claimed wildly different things, from checking herself into a mental hospital, to moving in with Dave, to breaking up with Dave, to getting a job in Kansas. At the same time, Carrie's father died and she didn't show up for the funeral. In fact, no one she knew had seen her since November. No strangers met her. No surveillance footage of her after November of 2012. Police did contact Dave and Dave was open and honest with things. They went to Liz even and she was honest as she could be at the time. Yet it was strange. Carrie disappeared off the face of the earth. Yet she wasn't a missing person. She was somewhat in contact including threatening the police for going to Dave and telling them to leave him out of it. In one instance, her mother got a message from Carrie stating that Carrie sold all of Carrie's furniture and sent a picture of a check to her mother to prove it. A check with a name that seemed a bit familiar. The check was signed by Liz. Now Liz would say that Carrie had stolen her checkbook, but while that was a reasonable explanation, everything seemed odd. Max and Carrie's mother Nancy were highly suspicious that it wasn't Carrie that they were in contact with. To the point that Max challenged the sender to answer a series of questions only his mother would know. Those questions were, what is my middle name? What is our first boxer's name? Who was my best friend as a little kid? He got no response. In January of 2013, Dave went home after a long day of work, where he noticed an SUV covered in snow. One he knew because he worked on it. Carrie's car had resurfaced, and the police towed it. Inside, there was nothing except for a fingerprint on a mint container in the center console, and it was one that didn't match Carrie Farver. As time moved on, the messages became less and less, as well as Dave's interest in Liz. Dave had began drinking to cope with what was going on. Years of dealing with this fear had driven him to the bottle. He had moved back closer to Amy and his children. He got a new job, and he took precautions. He had bought a gun because he feared that the person posing as Carrie would come around, and he needed to protect himself. One night, though, his gun was stolen. It was 2015, and new detectives had taken over the case. It was a puzzling case, one that had a question. Was Carrie Farver the one behind this stalking? They looked at it from two different angles. One would investigate as if Carrie was alive, the other as if she was not. If someone had taken over her identity online, it might be a case that she was no longer with us. It wasn't long until the one who was investigating based on Carrie being alive hit a brick wall, and the one who was investigating as if she was dead had no leads. This all changed, though, when Liz filed a harassment complaint. Not against Carrie, against Amy. Liz had come to believe that Amy was actually the one behind Dave's stalking. That Amy had taken over Carrie's identity and was using it to stalk and harass Dave and Liz. Which would make sense, as Amy had a long relationship with Dave, and seeing a new woman with him might have driven her over the edge. The day after Liz filed that complaint, she was walking through a park when she was shot in the thigh. She claimed Amy had shot her. But here's the thing, at this point, the police, well, they didn't believe her story. The detectives assigned to the case had mountains of evidence provided by Dave and Liz, including cell phone data. Not only that, but Amy was at home with her children and there was enough evidence to prove that Liz was not shot by Amy. No, the person who shot Liz was Liz. And the person who was pretending to be Carrie Farver was also Liz. Found on Liz's phone was a picture of Carrie's SUV a month before it was found again. Everything you have deleted from your phone and computer, it never goes away. So that is a reminder if any of you do anything illegal, do not take photos of it. Anyways, the police had found a video entitled Husband's Cheating Place, which was a video outside of Dave's apartment building. 
Everything pointed to Liz being the cause of the harassment. Liz had used an app on her phone that would time when texts and emails were delivered so that she could look innocent. She had written horror on her own garage. She set fire to her own house. Her fingerprint was on the mint tin in Carrie's car, so they figured out who was stalking Dave, but not with what happened to Carrie. So they needed to be stealthy about it. They didn't show that they had evidence that Liz had done something. And since she seemed to want to blame Amy for this, well, they gave her a chance. They told her that they had found remains. They implied it was Carrie's, even though they did not have any remains. They dropped a hint that they could not proceed unless Amy confessed. And lo and behold, Liz provided it, claiming to have emailed Amy and that Amy confessed to not only shooting Liz, but killing Carrie. Pretty much claiming that Amy had killed Carrie in Carrie's car by stabbing her and then burning the body and throwing it in the garbage. They went back to the car and lifted the upholstery and found bloodstains in the passenger seat of the car. Dave was told by Liz that police had found a body, so he called the police to ask about it. But the police only gave him the advice that he should move in with Amy to protect them for the time being, and to avoid Liz at any cost. Which he did, because Dave wasn't an idiot, and he put two and two together. This whole entire thing set off Liz. Either way, Liz was arrested and there was a mountain of evidence against her. Problem was, there was no body. As trial loomed, the police went to Dave to ask for help. Dave remembered that he had an old tablet that sometimes Liz would use, so he handed it over. Inside it was an SD card that had been deleted. But remember, nothing is lost forever, and this is what they found. A photo of a decomposing foot with a tattoo on it. A tattoo that Carrie had. Carrie had been murdered by Liz, and Liz's trial was a bench trial, and Liz was found guilty and sentenced to life in prison. Her obsession with Dave had forced a love triangle on two people who did not know that they were a part of it. Liz did this to bring her and Dave closer. She wanted him, she was obsessed with him, and she was willing to harm anyone who stopped her from having him. Max lost his mother, Nancy lost her daughter. Dave suffered years of mental torture thinking that a woman he had feelings for was to blame, only to find out it wasn't. Max is in college now, studying computer science in honor of his mother. I am sorry I had to lead you all to believe that Carrie was harassing and stalking Dave. I wanted to tell the story this way so you can see how you shouldn't judge a book by its cover. Next week, the start of a new project. We talk about criminals all the time on this channel, but what about the people who were put in prison for crimes they didn't commit? Next week's video touches on the youngest person ever executed in South Carolina, a 14-year-old boy named George Stinney, an innocent child killed by the state. Till then.